It's an audience. You, Out into cyberspace. You, you yes. got you got to be flexible. Yes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Hudson Institute, be welcome to this event on Colombia and its relations with the United States. We have with us a most distinguished team of experts who will share their knowledge on the central theme of our discussions. I assure you that you will be most interested and rewarded by all angles of this historic event. And I begin by a small chapter of my personal experience in this complex uh, history. As Costa Rica's ambassador in Washington, D.C., I was privileged to learn a great deal of how the Plan Colombia came into being back in 1999-2000, when Colombian forces and the civilian population were suffering increasing attacks and losses from left-wing contingents supported by Cuba and her usual concert of sponsors. The then president of Colombia, Alvaro Uribe, a very courageous leader, was able to obtain from Washington and leading Western democracies important support in this conflict that threatened a leading democracy. We all know the threat of this story and the victory obtained by President Uribe and above all, Colombia. Let me only add that we were honored by the visit of President Uribe years later here at Hudson. His presence inspired deep respect and admiration. Well, I believe I have exhausted my allotted time. Again, we thank you for your attendance this afternoon, and I turn the uh, microphone symbolically mm -hmm. to the moderator of the colloquium, my colleague, Liz Smith. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Ambassador. Thank you very kindly, Ambassador. And uh, I, uh, I repeat his thanks. Thank you for coming to Hudson Institute this afternoon. We have really a really phenomenal panel. Um, we'll be speaking about uh, Colombia uh, strategic and security challenges in the U.S.-Colombia alliance, and I'll introduce uh, I'll introduce our panelists. Um, this is Dr. Evan Ellis, professor at Latin American Studies at the Strategic Studies Institute, U.S. Army War College. Um, Jose Cardenas, um, who is the former assistant administrator for Latin America, U.S. Agency for International Development in the George W. Bush administration, and to my immediate left is Dr. David Spencer, an associate professor. Uh, William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Studies. Uh, I believe that uh, by agreement, uh, Dr. Ellis will be starting off this afternoon's this afternoon's panel. I believe that we'll be going right to a a PowerPoint. However, you feel most comfortable. Whether you, again, whether you'd like to sit or whether you'd like to stand. Thanks very much again. I always uh, like to explain that uh, when I stand up and present, I at least keep myself awake, but uh, hopefully we'll uh, be able to keep uh, you all engaged as well. I'd like to thank the Hudson Institute, uh, Ambassador Darren Bloom and in the group uh, here for, for your time and interest in, in this topic, a very important uh, topic, uh, both uh, with respect to the um, you know, Columbia itself and its implications for the long relationship that we've had with, um, in, in the United States. Uh, I want to have a, just a brief series of, of points uh, First of all, beginning with some general thoughts about uh, Colombia and the context in which the U.S.-Colombian relationship uh, it takes place. So I'm going to go relatively quickly so I leave time for the other speakers. First of all, important to understand the social and economic context uh, in which uh, what's happening in Colombia is playing out today. If you, if you go back to the post-World War II period and La Violencia, um, the, the deep 
hurt feelings with with assassination of of the the, the liberals and 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 and, and others, um, coupled with a, a long period really of what can be termed as as rural neglect, a, a dichotomy that long existed in Colombia between the relative sophistication and prosperity of of the cities, um, and a lack of attention at least by the, by the government to what was going on in the countryside. There are special cases that continue to have impacts today. One of them is, is the coastal strip, especially uh, from about Buena Ventura in, in the middle of Colombia's Pacific coast uh, down to the border with Ecuador uh, uh, near Tumaco. Um, other places like, the, of course, the, the Llanos, the, the, the eastern plains, which again, long had a relatively minimal state presence. When we talk about the Colombian guerrilla groups, uh, the recently demobilized uh, FARC, as, as, well as, uh, as well as others, I think it's important to acknowledge that while the FARC started out with an ideological base, uh, its greatest expansion that one can say really began in 1982 when in the 7th uh, FARC Congress it embraced uh, uh, engagement with uh, narco-terrorist uh, and, and uh, narcotics activity go going on. That fueled a chain of activities which allowed the FARC not only divorce themselves from their ideological base, but enabled them to have some of the military capabilities that ultimately by 1996, 1998, were leading to a series of relatively stunning victories against the Colombian government and, and uh, some very pessimistic appraisals by the United States, uh, the possibility that the FARC uh, could indeed possibly take over the Colombian government uh, within a matter of just a few years. Of course, that was then, this is now. But when we talk about Plan Colombia, I think it's also important to recognize that the inception of Plan Colombia was based around uh, fighting the drug flows uh, that were seen as, as dramatically impacting and, and permeating Colombian society, Colombian government at, at all levels. But after our 9-11 uh, uh, here, here in the United States, and really with uh, President Uribe's arrival in, in 2002, um, the focus of the US security engagement really made a subtle transition, not abandoning the fight against narco-trafficking, but taking a, a much more explicit focus on also helping to do counter-terrorist activities than what it had been previously. When we talk about the success of Colombia, I think it's important to recognize this idea that really what it's all been about is reconnecting the Colombian state with the Colombian people. Uh, one of the key things in the successes that have occurred thus with that process have been coordination. Coordination between the activities of the security forces in, in, in attacking and clearing out threats, uh, bringing in the police and others, bringing in the government's rebuilding faith between the population, uh, providing government services as, as well as opportunities for people to participate in the legitimate economy and how that has created a positive feedback cycle. When we talk about Venezuela, it's important, I think, to recognize the interdependence that has long existed between Colombia and Venezuela. Um, as you can see from, from the map here, when you take a look especially at the, the border, the Colombia-Venezuela border, um, what you recognize is that there was long flows of, of people. Of course, uh, as is commonly known, uh, Nicolas Maduro was probably actually born in Colombia as a Colombian, technically making him illegitimate to, to be head of, of Venezuela today. But um, beyond that, uh, it is, there were long flows of people. Oftentimes, when Venezuela was the more prosperous of, of the two, going to uh, going going to Venezuela in search of of, of goods or or work or, or other things, um, and, and so the fluidity that we find between the borders is, is something that has been a long-standing thing. Uh, with respect to what I call lessons unlearned, I think this is particularly important to, to remember today. In 2005, uh, there was a decision made as the uh, Essentially, the, the, the militia groups uh, were demobilized. Those who had formed themselves into a political organization, the Alto Defensas Unidas de Colombia, the, the famous AUC. Um, but there was much hope that that demobilization would bring at least a, a partial peace. But of the 7,000 people who were offered up for demobilization, about 31,000 ended up taking the benefits. And of those 31,000, what quickly happened was that you jumped to about 32 new criminal groups, uh, the Bakrim, so to speak, who rapidly fought it out, uh, generating actually a dramatic increase in violence. In 2016, Colombians, remembering the lessons of the distant past, looked to that 2005-2006 period and what came later and said, um, the demobilization of about the same number of, of FARC guerrillas may end in a similar fashion. 
and it appears today that they were right. And so there continues to be the, unlessened, the lessons unlearned from demobilization gone bad and the way that it contributes to the morphing of the threat and criminality. A couple of things that I, I wanted to comment with respect to the security challenges. And I will focus on what I believe are four groups of interdependent security challenges that the Colombian state faces. And the reason that I wanted to begin with those previous comments was to set the stage for some of the lessons which I think have been uh, really common um, and repeating factors uh, within, uh, within Colombia's history. So number one, I would say, is the dramatic expansion of criminal revenue streams. I want to be clear that I'm not just talking about drugs here. Clearly, as has been pointed out, uh, cocoa production and, re by relation, cocaine has taken off. It seemed that the Colombian government had made remarkable progress bringing down cocoa production to about uh, 40,000 hectares under, um, uh, under cultivation. Uh, with the elimination of aerial spraying glyphosate, um, but not just because of that, it has taken off uh, to an estimated 2009 or 2000, uh, 209, 210,000 hectares. One of the problems has been, frankly, a poor funding of and a poor conceptualization of what was called a voluntary eradication program, although, frankly, voluntary eradication for the past 10, 15 years has never been terribly successful or coordinated in, in Colombia. But um, although uh, President Duque has uh, turned to an expanded use of forced eradication, that also has had its, its difficulties. But again, I don't want to blame just uh, cocoa production because some of the other significant sources of, of revenue for criminal groups in Colombia, when we talk about, for example, illegal mining, especially gold, uh, to a certain extent, uh, coltan as, as well, um, and other activities arguably produce just as much, if not more, money, depending on the price of, of minerals, than the drug flows do. Number two, in terms of challenges, is what I would call the fragmentation and restructuring, rather than demobilization, of criminal groups. And there are several different areas where the threat has been most acute. So you can take a look at, the, for example, the, the south and the southwest of, of Colombia, places like Putamayo, where that threat, which had always spilled over to Ecuador to some degree, has particularly been affecting Ecuador in, in recent months. Um, in the, the plains, uh, Guaviare, and in other places, in, in the Llanos, uh, and also as you move up towards the, the Venezuelan uh, Colombian border, uh, again, uh, places like Norte de Santander, and particularly uh, very troublesome areas uh, such, such as Catatumbo, uh, which are also fed by the lack of control of the Venezuelan state um, and the flows of thousands and thousands of refugees across that border. But as happened in 2005, what you're finding is the demobilization of the FARC, which at least was uh, theoretically completed uh, you know, only about a year ago, has led, uh, first of all, so the first and seventh fronts, or at least elements of them, um, the, so to speak, uh, FARC dissidents, uh, which were the groups most heavily involved in drug trafficking, never fully gave up. Uh, at the same time, the disaffe disaffection of others has caused other groups of FARC um, to flow back into those groups. And then, of course, you have the social support groups, the FARC militia, so to speak, partially operating in Venezuela, partially operating in, in Colombia. So that combination of the dissidents, the dissidents now working together to, to try to um, rebuild their strength, uh, dissatisfied FARC flowing back into those dissident groups, um, and those support bases and monetary bases in Venezuela has all combined to, in many ways, create a problem which was uh, as difficult or as grave or perhaps even graver than what you had just talking about the FARC before 2016. In addition to that, of course, you had those elements of the FARC who, um, even before the accords were put into place, began flowing and have continued to flow into the hands of the other, uh, at least ideological terrorist uh, group in, in the country, the ELN, uh, a group which, uh, because of its combination of, of the use of, of kidnapping, involvement in the illegal mining trade and other things, continues to cause a great deal of problems, as we've seen through the relatively uh, brash attack against the General Santander uh, Police Cadet School in, in Bogota just a couple months ago. And of course, you have also the fragmentation, as we see in Mexico and in other places, of the criminal bands. There was a time when it seemed that there was a consolidation of many of those, I mentioned, 32 fighting groups down to uh, three or four of which the, so to speak, um, the Urabeños um, or the Usaga clan or the Gulf clan, depending on who is 
politically not being offended by, by, by the name. Um, but like uh, Osama bin Laden in the United States, the, the Usaga clan really became enemy number one. And frankly, uh, the Colombian government has had relatively significant successes in targeting their leadership, both the financial leadership as, as well as the, uh, um, the, uh, the other leadership, uh, to the point in which that group is beginning to degenerate into others. Uh, we can talk about uh, splinter groups like, like the Caparapos, who, although they themselves have been successful, the very success that they have breaking off from the, the Usaga clan suggests how things are, are transforming. Um, and even to the point where, um, in a way never seen before, uh, Mexican representatives from groups like the Sinaloa cartel and, and uh, Jalisco Nueva Generacion and others are beginning to come into the country to try to figure out, well, just who do we work with now to get the cocaine and other drugs up from Colombia um, through Central America, through, through the Caribbean. Beyond that, I would also talk about two final major groups of security challenges, uh, and I suspect we'll talk about this a lot more uh, during the question and answer as well, but Venezuela. It's difficult to underestimate the degree of damage that the situation in Venezuela is causing for Colombia. Um, just in terms of those who have stayed in Colombia, an estimated 1.2, but it may already be far higher than that, 1.2 million people have gone from Venezuela. Um, those who used to come across, especially a Cucuta, um, and fled into the rest of the country to work for a couple of weeks, they're beginning to stay now. Um, moreover, even a greater number have passed through Colombia, often on foot, to Ecuador, to Peru, to Chile, to Argentina, as well as going elsewhere in the region. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, groups such as the ELN um, and some of the paramilitary groups, such as the Pelusos, the, the, the EPL, etc. cetera, um, as you know, anytime you have thousands of desperate people coming through a, a border, as is what is happening right now, those people become fodder for the criminal groups that operate there. And so it's not just a matter of, of Venezuelans putting a social strain on, on Colombia, but desperate Venezuelans looking for a way to feed their families, looking for a way just to hang on and survive a few new days. Um, in a highly corrupt, controlled border region in which you have multiple criminal groups fighting it out, it's just a recipe for disaster. And then finally, of course, uh, what I referred to before, the broader political panorama in Colombia. Dissatisfaction leading to violence. As one of my colleagues pointed out, um, if you like the FARC or not, the bottom line is the way that the accord has gone down, nobody is happy. Um, so on the one hand, of course, you have frustration that led President Duque to question the uh, agreements that were made and, and the special jurisdiction for, for, for peace, um, whether essentially those people who, the Colombians are very proud, frankly, of their political system and their legal system. Granted, it's imperfect. However, um, for many Colombians, mi esposa es Rola de Bogota, mi esposa es Colombiana. So I, I can tell you firsthand, um, you know, because my wife is, is also a Colombian, I've had the honor to work with many Colombians on both the business and other realms over the years. The Colombians are very proud of their, their judicial system, however imperfect. And there was the sense that essentially terrorists who had flaunted the laws and who were almost beaten had basically been given a free pass for their activities. Um, then, of course, on the other side, there was expectations by the FARC that they were going to emerge into a great new political party. Um, now, that didn't work out so well. They won point. 34%, not 34%, 0.34% of the vote in the recent congressional election, showing the, the depth of their popularity. And so thus, except for, for a period of, of, of two terms, the, the temporary representation that they have in the Congress, um, there wasn't even a viable FARC presidential candidate. And so the FARC is looking at, on the one hand, no real root for political power. Uh, Many of the things that were promised to them with respect to, to reforms, land and things like that, the money wasn't forthcoming for that. The money wasn't forthcoming for rural infrastructure. Some of their key leaders who had the bad decision to continue after the accords and their involvement in narco-trafficking, like Jesus Santrich, um, have been, again, uh, have been uh, had, you know, having serious action taken against them. And so whether you were against the FARC or whether you had some degree of hope that they would turn into a social movement, everybody at this point is dissatisfied. And so to conclude, um, 
just a couple of other issues that I think are worth making um, note of. Number one is the future of the Colombian military. Um, frankly, the Colombian military is one of the most professional and capable in the region. Uh, they didn't have the victories that they have against the FARC for the, in, you know, the, the past two decades for, 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 for nothing. Um, they are an important exporter of security to our other partners in the region in Central America and elsewhere. Um, they're moving to a NATO standard and have been an important international partner in, in other ways. Um, they have a process that they refer to as transformation. Um, and there's a question of what does the role of the military, just like in the United States at the end of the Cold War, we wrestled with the transformation of our own military. Um, now, in all fairness, it's important to say that the Colombians do have commercial and other relationships with China. Um, it was actually uh, one of the best military schools in the region uh, is actually in the uh, Tolamaida base where we do a lot of our work, uh, something called the Lanceros course. It's a very elite special operations. Uh, and of course, predictably, the, the Chinese came and, uh, and, and participated in that, and they participated in the Colombian demining school and, and other things. Um, the Chinese have provided uh, certain amounts of, of military hardware. So despite that very close relationship that the United States has had, um, there are still other relationships that the Colombians have. Obviously, also with President Duque coming in uh, just this past fall, he has initiated a new security plan that focuses on creating new new zones and disarticulating the um, what they call the GAO, the uh, the armed organized groups, which means basically criminals, ex FARC, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's um, some I, you know idea of resurrecting some of the ideas that, that worked very well for Alvaro Uribe previously, but it remains to be seen how President Duque's new security plan will, will, will play out, although there have been some successes to date. And then finally, issues for the United States. First of all, the question, um, we had a lot of success and a close partnership working with Colombian in the relationship. What will be the next chapter? Where does the U.S. Colombian relationship go from, from here now that it's no longer cemented by working together just on counter narcotics or working together just against the FARC and the ELN? Number two, this idea of um, the way in which Colombian drug production, other criminal activity is destabilizing virtually the entire region. I mean, it's, it's, there's a synergy with Colombia and Venezuela. It's impacting the Caribbean. It's impacting um, the rest. And again, um, the degree to which um, the way things could unfold in Venezuela provides a very serious, serious challenge um, to Colombia. Now, at the very first slide, and I'll just end with this thought, um, one of the things that I, that I point out is that Colombia, for me, is what I call a partnership of success, myth, and family. And what I mean by that is that in many ways, the way we think about Colombia, and I remember in 1996 when we were on the brink of decertifying Colombia because of the state's involvement with narco-trafficking and how far they have come, but in many ways, we define much of the narrative in terms of the successes that Colombia has had with at least a little bit of US help. In many ways, though, I say a myth because I think there's a lot of concepts that aren't quite accurate about why and how the Colombians succeeded and what the nature of, of the relationship is. And finally, I say it's a partnership of family. And for those of you who remember, for example, when Southcom used to be in Panama and some of the other we, the military, and others have defined ourselves by this relationship. And so especially in Latin America, um, I hesitate to say there are, there are more Colombian military spouses than perhaps with any other country in, in, in Latin America. But beyond just those type of things, um, the relationship with Colombia, I think, is evidenced by this group here today, has really become a family affair, a family affair in terms of the bond of spilt blood working together over the years, as well as those other bonds of family. And so uh, wherever it goes in the future, I, I think that family relationship, as you know with all family relationships, you can get annoyed at the uncle over, over the, the years for his behavior at the party. But at the end of the day, family is still family. And I believe that is very much where we are with Columbia right now. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Evan. That, that was terrific. And I mean, one of the things that I know we'll, we'll want to come back to when we open it up for a more wide-ranging discussion is to, um, to talk about how that family relationship, you're talking about how it, it gets reconfigured now, how it may be reconfigured, and to what extent problems across the border in Venezuela may shape that in negative ways or may also shape it in positive ways as well if there are different ways that the U.S. and Colombia can work together on that. Um, Jose, if you would like, uh, is that OK? Thank would you. you like to? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Lee. And uh, also, thanks to the Hudson Institute for putting on another great uh, forum, and timely forum. And a special note of uh, 
recognition for uh, Ambassador Darren Bloom, uh, somebody who has had a great impact on my own thinking about uh, events in the hemisphere, how to think about it, and um, I, I dearly uh, respect all of the, all that you've done for democracy and, and peace uh, and the well-being of our hemisphere. Um, Evan, I, I did not know that you were married to a, 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 a Colombian. As a son of Colombian, Colombia myself, when people ask me about Colombia, I usually say, well, the country's known for three things. One is beautiful flowers, the second one is beautiful women, and then I change the subject. <laughs> um, I'm just, uh, Evan has provided such a, a, a great uh, overview of some of the challenges that Colombia is experiencing right now. I just want to kind of uh, just add a little bit more uh, color, uh, a little bit more opinion on the facts, which I absolutely agree with, uh, as Evan has laid out in his presentation. Um, I, I think that w one point that I, I, I would want you to walk away from this forum, at least from, from my perspective, is this, is that for the past 15 years or so, it's been an article of faith in Washington among the foreign policy establishment that Planet Columbia constitutes a great strategic success uh, for United States foreign policy over the last 15 years. You can't say that about a lot of other different areas of the world. And uh, there's a lot of uh, mutual uh, back padding on, on, on that accomplishment. However, what I say today is that the gains that have been made over the last 20 years since the inception of Plan Columbia are under threat. And it is a new challenge for U.S. foreign policy to make sure to work with our strategic partners in Colombia not to let that happen. Now, I, I, I hate to use a cliche, but uh, it is. It's a perfect storm of, of various uh, uh, threats and problems that is challenging the current administration. Um, not to be too flippant, but uh, President Santos got a Nobel Peace Prize for his uh, peace agreement with the FARC. And my response is, the Colombian people got the shaft. I think that this peace process, as it was concluded, as it was negotiated, has been an unmitigated disaster for Colombia. I think that what, what we see in, in breaking down, you know, OK, why is that so? How is that so? I think, uh, as Evan uh, mentioned the, the explosion of, uh, of coca cultivation. President Santos, Juan Manuel, Juan Manuel Santos, made so much, he was so, so focused on getting that signed piece of paper with the FARC that he, he took his eye off what made Colombia successful. And that was aggressive counterinsurgency capacity, aggressive counter narcotics. All of those were reduced in order uh, to provide concessions to the FARC. The elimination of aerial spraying, the de-emphasis of counterinsurgency, the de-emphasis on the broader counter-narcotics opened the door for the, uh, this, this spike, this explosion of coca cultivation whose reduction had been one of the hallmarks of Plan Columbia. The second uh, consequence is that President Santos, uh, on paper, uh, signed a, a, a wonderful agreement. It, it was poetry, if it had all occurred. But it ran into the real world. And it also ran into uh, over-promises and commitments for which the Colombian state 
was not prepared for. In other words, when you have demobilization of FARC fighters, they will, uh, well, many of them went to the reintegration camps, leaving the field, leaving territory where they had once held sway. The Colombian government was not prepared in any way to fill that vacuum on day two of the agreement. When the FARC starts leaving their, their areas of control, the Colombian state was not prepared to move in and establish governmental authority in those areas. So what was the result? That vacuum was filled by simply more criminal organizations, different criminal organizations, some affiliated with the FARC, uh, some with uh, Mexican cartels. So after a lull following the, uh, the signing of the agreement, we now see violence in these areas now spiking up again because the vacuum was filled not by the Colombian state but by other criminal organizations who are profiting from the drug trafficking. And that is the fault of the Colombian state under Santos that was not prepared uh, to move in. The peace plan, again, made, made a lot of commitments, made a lot of promises that the state was not prepared to carry out. And that is when you get into reintegration. Uh, there, there were plans, for example, you were bringing FARC fighters into these camps. They were supposed to have programs to reintegrate them into Colombian society. Uh, those, those plans were not carried out, lack of planning, lack of uh, resources. And so what happens is, is that the people, the former foot soldiers, the former guerreros, went, you know, left. And we've seen, we're seeing uh, many of those uh, demobilized FARC fighters who have become frustrated waiting in these camps for some indication that, uh, that they would receive job training, that they had, there were plans to reintegrate them into society as productive, honest, peaceful members. And those plans never came to fruition. Now, the fourth aspect, probably the worst, again, as Evan has uh, ha indicated, is Venezuela's implosion. It's had a devastating impact on Colombia's uh, attempts to regain control under new president Duque, who is uh, you know, left with this mess on his doorstep of uh, unimplemented aspects of the peace plan and the results, as I've just mentioned. And here's Duque uh, coming into office and he's got a mess of problems that, uh, that he's got to deal with. He's, not only does he have to, uh, we know that the U.S. is, is, is very, very, very concerned about the, uh, the, the coca cultivation, the rise in coca cultivation. We saw that frustration evidenced by President Trump himself about a week ago. So, and, and, and based on my conversations with people in the administration, there is even talk of decertifying Colombia again, which would be a devastating blow, again, to Plan Colombia and what everybody recognized was such a great achievement in its time. But now here we are where people in a presidential, U.S. Presidential, presidential administration are actually talking about decertifying Colombia in 2019. It is a terrible, terrible signal uh, of, of, of something that's gone very wrong. And so even as the United States wants to work with Duque, he's, he's predisposed, he wants to get back, he wants to get Colombia back to where it was prior to the peace agreement. And, you know, we are... Uh, and he's struggling, and we're struggling with the fallout 
in Venezuela? How does Venezuela impact Colombia? Why is it such a uh, impediment to uh, Duque's uh, ambition to, again, get Colombia back on the straight and narrow, get it back on the right path? Again, Evan indicated the, uh, the flow of refugees. There's over a million Venezuelans now in Colombia, absolutely stressing the, uh, the services, the support services in Colombia at this time. The second is that, you know, we know there's no, no, there's no love loss between Colombia and uh, the Maduro government. It, it started with Hugo Chavez. Uh, Colombia has always been a target of the, uh, the extreme left uh, in Latin America because of its strong partnership with the United States. Maduro has, even with all of the, all of the crises facing Maduro right now, he's got one eye on the domestic situation in his own country, he's got one eye on Colombia. Because he can, if, if Duque uh, is seen as being too much of a complication or uh, too, too aggressive a, a political actor in pressuring for peaceful change in Venezuela, Maduro has assets to cause trouble, and that is the ELN and other criminal groups. The ELN has camps all throughout Venezuelan territory. Maduro can control the pressure on, on Duque with a snap of a finger with the ELN camps. The drug trafficking is coming through with the complicity of the Venezuelan military is coming through uh, Venezuelan territory. So the, the two countries are not only geographically connected at the hip, but in this crisis are uh, connected as well. And there will be no resolution in Venezuela without a strong and secure Colombia as a partner with the United States, the Lima Group, the EU, if they, if they decide to, to be helpful, more helpful in, in Venezuela. So uh, it's, it's intimately connected to the situation in Venezuela. And, and that's another strategic reason why the United States has a, a seminal interest in helping President Duque. And, because we got to get back to where we once were, and that is a relatively secure Colombia with uh, control of its territory and keeping the malefactors like the FARC, the ELN, and the drug traffickers in check. Thank you. Thanks, Jose. That was terrific. Um, <laughs> One of, uh, one of the questions, just taking notes here, the things that I definitely want to come back to later when we start speaking uh, more openly, but what the situation is like that when a president, uh, when a leader of a country inherits another, his, his predecessor's plan, and there was already unease over this, and now he actually has to deal with the reality. So that, I, I think that's something that will be really interesting. But before we move on, if I can just ask very quickly, what, what at this point, decertifying Colombia, what would that entail? What would that mean? Well, it, it, it is uh, first and foremost the political uh -huh. signal it sends. Right. And it is a, uh, what it does is, I hate to say it, but you know, for the last 20 years, the United States and Colombia, it, it has become an, a, uh, a part of the political landscape, mm -hmm. our alliance above all any alliance, any relationship in Latin America, you had the U.S.-Columbia alliance. They help us in counter-narcotics training in other countries. Uh, they, um, they are with us in uh, you know, pursuing the same 
regional security objectives. And here we are pinning a scarlet letter uh, on their lapel. It's the psychological and the political symbol it sends around is, is devastating. Okay, great. David, if you would uh, you continue, thank you. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm not sure I have anything left to say, but I think <laughs> my own fault for volunteering to go last. Um, <laughs> but anyway, no, I will, so I will um, uh, I'll basically comment on some things that were said. I, I agree with uh, both my colleagues here. I think they did a really good job in kind of giving an overview. Um, I think one of the things that, that we need to understand, especially looking at the Duque government, besides the fact that it inherited this really messy uh, peace agreement, nobody's against peace. And I think that's, that's really important to say. Nobody's against peace as a concept or the idea of making peace with the FARC. I think people are against very messy aspects of this particular peace agreement. And it's really important to emphasize. But that's, I I'll come back to that later. Um, president Duque is a minority president. Uh, you know, obviously, the majority of Colombians elected him, but in Congress, he has a minority. And so he, he ha he's having a really hard time passing his program uh, from tax reform to uh, you know, modifying the special jurisdiction for peace, the, the transitional peace agreement, to uh, you know, getting spraying, uh, you know, getting the Congress to approve spraying and then getting the court to approve it as well. So, so he's in a really difficult position politically because he doesn't have a majority in Congress. Now, his problem is that when he came in, he tried to be nice to everybody. He tried to, he tried to convince people with his very, you know, he, he's a very logical guy. I, I knew him when he was here at the Inter-American Development Bank. He'd come over to the Perry Center and work with us. He's, he's one of the smartest guys I know. He's, he's, he's like a genius. He's also an extremely moral person, and so he would try to persuade people to, you know, to accept his points of view and of course, that doesn't work very well in politics. And while he was doing that, he was, he was, he was not convincing the opposition, but he was also angering the people that voted, voted him into power because he was kind of compromising on things that he had promised. And so his poll numbers went way down. I think they got into the low 20s at one point. Um, and ironically, I think the Venezuela situation has kind of saved him. He's gone back with the polls because of his leadership with the Venezuela position. So I think it's really important when you're analyzing Colombia to understand the political difficulties that, that President Duque um, is facing. And that, and that makes all the difference um, in terms of his ability to be an effective uh, president. I think the second thing that, that is important to understand is that he inherited a really bad economic situation. So you know, a lot of the, a lot of the progress that was, that was made and a lot of the, the good news that was coming out of Colombia between, let's say, 2006 to 2015, approximately, was because of a, of a really robust uh, economy, um, a growth in oil production, and and the oil international oil prices, which were very very high, um, and right and and towards the latter half of the the um, Santos administration, uh, two things happened. Number one, oil prices went way down, and number two, oil reserves um, are running out in Colombia, and are I think they're predicted to be over, but it'd be essentially out of oil. Um, I don't remember the. I'm not an economist, so I don't remember the exact date, but pretty soon. And and one of the problems is that that there is more oil in Colombia, but to do oil exploration, you need the price of oil to be at a certain level. I think it's like sixty dollars a barrel to break even. And and for a long time, uh, that wasn't the case. And and so a price that was below uh, the price of making oil exploration profitable, and then of course oil takes about five years. Once you've found a deposit, you, you know, the build the infrastructure to begin uh, exploiting the oil, it takes about five years. So he's in this really bad kind of economic lull at the same time that he inherited this really complicated situation. So y you have to have some sympathy for them. He, they're, they're in a very, very difficult um, situation. They've been handed a really big bag of lemons, and it's not clear that they can make lemonade <laughs> out of those lemons. Um, another point, so so, I, so I've written an article that's in Prism Magazine, published by the National Defense University. You can go online and get it. Uh, I'm not going to repeat everything because most, like I said, they they said most everything. But I do want to I would do want to point out a couple of things. I read the article. Yeah, he, so. he recommended he, he, he it. To me. I thought it was very nice. No, congratulations. <laughs> I, I highly recommend it. Very informative. Okay, so. thank you. Right. Um, but so one of the questions I have, and, and and it really bothers me when people talk about FARC dissidents, because I'm not so sure that they're really dissidents. You know, I'm not really sure that this fragmentation of these groups has, has, take, has taken place. Um, 
no no group demobilizes negotiates a peace process that has as much money as the fart to become poor and significant irrelevant political party and and a couple of things that there's several things that that to me indicate that that this dissidence thing is really kind of a, a facade um, number one is that uh, FARC were very open throughout the entire negotiation saying they were not giving up their plans to make revolution in Colombia. Right? They were negotiating into the conflict but not their plans to make revolution. They were very open about it. I mean, and it was stunning you know, how, how open they were and how Benotti paid attention to it. And when I, when I, um, I was working uh, in the Pentagon at the time, I was on loan to the Pentagon for about five years um, during the last part of the, this, this period with the FARC or the official period with the FARC. And um, and I kept on pointing out these guys are saying that they're trying to continue revolution. They said, "Oh, Dave, that you know that's just rhetoric. They're just saying that stuff to because you know they have to." And 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 that bothered me because I've been studying FARC for a long time. I've been studying FARC since for about 25 years, and 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 FARC are very bureaucratic. Have always been very bureaucratic, and they write down what they say. And when they write something, they mean it. I mean, they they angst over what they write. And so if they write something, that's, that's not propaganda. That's, especially if they write it for an internal audience, that's what they mean. And, and FARC, uh, since 1982, has, has developed a strategic plan. They've, they, held, they hold conferences. They're very old-fashioned communist party. They have these strategic level conferences where they, where, they, uh, m where they put out their strategy or they modify their strategy. And, and, and every year, you would see FARC fronts. I, I used to work a lot with the military and, and look at the, the capture documents they got. Every front would have a, have a conference, and they would write up a document saying, how is my front accomplishing the strategic plan? They would go down all the elements of the strategic plan and say, we did so many of this and so many of that and this, and we failed to do this, and our plan for next year is to, is to, do, you know, is to, is to follow the plan. And so they're very, very conscious and disciplined about following the plan. And so if FARC writes something, they mean it. And, and, and that's something that, that, that people dismiss all the time, and we always get caught flat-footed by dismissing that they mean what they write. Um, so going back to the FARC dissidents, um, a couple of things happened with the FARC dissidents that were, were very interesting. Number one is the head of the main group of FARC dissidents um, in the Eastern Plains is a guy named Gentil Duarte. And Gentil Duarte was a member of the, 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 the team that negotiated peace in Havana. And he came back from Havana, and he declared himself the dissident and said he wasn't going to demobilize. That, that's unprecedented in the FARC. I've I just never seen that. That kind of indiscipline, especially by someone that's been in the FARC that long, that just doesn't happen, right? And a couple of things with him that happened that, that make me also doubt that he really is a dissident is so FARC had to, as part of the peace process, they had to declare their assets, right? And so they made a declaration of their assets. And, and, what, and one, of the, one of the sentences was, oh, and by the way, 60% of our assets uh, were taken over by the dissidents, so oops, que pena, we, we, don't, we don't have them. Well, in my studies of FARC over the last 25 years, if you stole 10,000 pesos, which is about $3, they would kill you. Right? And there was no bloodshed between the dissidents and the main FARC. So that, to me, was a sign that, wait a minute, something's, something's really fishy here. The FARC would not allow somebody to take their assets without a major <laughs> fight. And there was no major fight, no bloodshed at all. Right? And so that tells me that, hmm, something's, something's a little weird. Um, uh, when they, um, the other thing that, that really, that this, and then this to me is the, the crown jewel, so to speak, uh, Evan mentioned it briefly, the, uh, the capture of Jesus Santrich. Jesus Santrich was also one of the negotiators of the FARC. Uh, and, he was, and he was in Havana the entire time. And I think it was last February, or I, can't, last, I don't remember the exact date. Um, you know, he was captured uh, with evidence showing that he was negotiating uh, the delivery of 10 tons of cocaine to the Mexican, to one of the Mexican cartels. And which this part didn't really get reported as much, and that there was plans to, to, to ship a total of 60 tons of cocaine to those cartels. Okay, so what has the story been? Oh, these dissident, you know, these dissident, you know, FARC leaders, you know, off doing weird things on their own. That, that just does not, it just does not add up. 
It just does not add up. Because FARC, if there's one thing about FARC, it's that they have discipline in their organization. If you stepped out of line, they would kill you. And he was part of not only the negotiating team, but the high command. And, and so uh, you know, I, I have no doubt that he was acting under the orders of somebody else. And the reason they chose him is he's blind. So who would suspect you know, Mr. Blind? Paul, you know, he, was a, he was a political, he was one of their political um, commissars. You know, who's going to suspect the political commissar, not the operations guy, of, of, negotiating, um, of negotiating drugs? And then the question that nobody's asked is, where was he going to get the drugs? Where was he going to get the drugs from? Well, guess what? It's the dissidents. OK? Well, they did. They, so the DEA acted, the DEA and the Fiscalia acted against Jesus Santrich because they were afraid. They actually had more information. And they were hoping to also capture Ivan, Ivan uh, Marquez, mm -hmm. right? Ivan Marquez, who's a member of this FARC secretariat. But they were afraid that, that information was going to be out and, they, and it was going to allow these guys to escape. Ivan Marquez is one of the one of the seven members of the secretariat. He rec he represented the Caribbean coast, the Caribbean bloc. He was slated to be one of the the senators for the FARC, right? And and he and another guy who was kind of like their special forces commander, El Paisa, um, fled as soon as this broke out you know, because there you know there, there was some pretty good information leading towards them. Where did they go? They went to where the dissidents are. <coughs> Jose del Guaviare. They went to the dissidents. If these guys are really dissidents, why are these guys going to where the dissidents are actually, you know, uh, in control? So it, that just doesn't add up to me. And I, and and I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of smoke and mirrors about about, you know, this that they're dissidents, that they're fragmented, because that's a really good narrative. That sounds like you know that's that that makes everything okay. But if they're really still part of the FARC, it means that the war really hasn't ended. Um, and I think, and I think that's a major. I think that's a major point that needs to be looked at, and needs to be looked at seriously. And and people need to look at it with an open mind. I think there, you know, some minds were closed. Uh, I was, you know, people said, yeah, they're going to be dissidents, but but, and so that has been. That's like, everything is a dissident. We can't look at it any other way. And and I've seen that, um, in the intelligence community, and other places where they they refuse to kind of look at the broader evidence. They're only looking for the evidence that supports the dissident narrative. So that's one of my questions. Um, what else? I, I, I think, you know, if you look at, you know, if you're looking at implementation of the peace process, the ELN, the FARC, Venezuela, all of it is undercut by narcotics. If you don't solve the narcotics problem in Colombia, you will not solve any of the other problems. Um, you know the the dissidents are the dissidents are are growing and they're acting because of the resources from drug trafficking. So is the ELN. The ELN has doubled. The ELN in uh, when the peace process was signed was at about 2,500. It's now around 5,000 uh, combatants. A lot of them are former FARC. A lot of them are former FARC. Um, uh, and and the Venezuela issue is is cannot be solved also without. Uh, well, let me let me get back to Venezuela. The peace implementation cannot be done without dealing with the drug trafficking thing. So the the peace the peace process and the peace program under that process um, is based on a lot of social programs and a lot of you know kind of a lot of things similar to what USAID is going out and helping people and alternative development and building roads and all this kind of stuff. And and and. Uh, <clears throat> Jose rightly, you know, talked about how there are not enough resources to do this, but 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 even worse than that is that they're competing with an increasing amount of drug resources, and essentially what will happen is if if you don't get drug trafficking under control, the state will never be able to compete with the money coming in from drug trafficking, and so and so the peace process is dead until you can deal with your drug trafficking problem. Okay, so let me let me deal with Venezuela and then I'll. Then I think my time is up, and and I'm sure you have tons of questions. Um, Venezuela. Uh, you can't talk about Colombia without talking about Venezuela. Um, a lot of people are hoping that with sanctions and with international censure, that the Venezuelan regime is going to fall. Oh, that's just not going to happen. And the reason it's not going to happen is because uh, I won't. I don't want to go quite. You know, so people. Some people in a, in a previous meeting I was in talked about the Venezuelan government as being a criminal organization. 
I, I don't go quite that far because they do have a semblance of a government, but it is a, it is a criminal government. It is a government that, that is no longer dependent on the legal economy for its survival. Okay? And Venezuela has gotten heavily involved, not as individuals. See, one of the problems is we keep on looking at it is, oh, we're going we're gonna to sanction this person because they're involved in drug trafficking. No, it's the entire government. The entire government is involved in criminal activity, and a lot of that criminal activity originates in Colombia. And so what is happening is that the, the explosion in coca crops in Colombia is fortifying the regime, which allows them to dig in and, and continue to implement their repressive policies, which then creates the refugees, which then goes back to Colombia, which then increases the criminality of Colombia. And so there's this vicious cycle going on, right, that if you don't go after drug trafficking, not as a public health problem, but as a, but as a security problem, you will never solve either Venezuela or, or Colombia. And I think that's really important. Okay, let me say the final thing. So that's all the bad news, and we might as well walk out of here and you know, abandon <laughs> Colombia. No. So um, the uh, National Security Advisor of Colombia uh, invited me to come and talk to him, uh, and, he, and he explained Colombia's new strategy. And I'm not going to explain the whole strategy because there just isn't time, but there are a couple of things that I think are really important. There is good news in Colombia, uh, and I hope that they do not decertify Colombia because Colombia has made progress in terms of eradication. Last year, they were able to eradicate 85,000 hectares of coca, and this year, they're looking at eradicating around 100,000 hectares of coca. Now, that's basically keeping up with replanting, but at least the coca crops is not, are not growing as they were in the past. Those numbers are compared to the last two years of the Santos administration, which was 35,000 and 50,000, respectively. So these are much better numbers than the Santos administration, which caused this problem, and, and they're getting better. So I think it would be in, not in our interest. In fact, I think it would be against our interest to decertify Colombia just because, you know, they're not going as fast as we'd like them to, because they are making significant progress based on what I can see. The second thing they've done is in their national strategy, they're looking at counter-narcotics not as, because the gringos are breathing down our necks, but, be, but as a way of protecting their own economic and, and uh, what do you call it, environmental resources, right? That this is a way of protecting, in Spanish you call it patrimonio nacional, your, your national you know, inheritance. You know, the, and, and, and the thing is they're right, because if you go to the areas where they're doing drug trafficking or they're doing illegal mining, they're devastated. They're completely devastated. So, so I think this is a novel way of looking at counter-narcotics, not as purely a, mm, the way we've looked at it in the past, but as, as actually positively protecting the resources of the country. And I, and I think, that, and I think that's, a, a, that's a way of convincing people, and even the left can't, can't be against fighting you know, to keep to preserve the environment, right? You, you just can't. Um, the other, the other uh, issue that they're, that they're looking at is local area control. Jaime said, you know, they've abandoned these areas and the criminals have walked in. Uh, Duque is aware of that. The Duque government is aware of that. And the, new, and the new moniker is we need to establish local area control. Now, part of the problem in the past in Colombia, the Colombians are some of the greatest planners I've ever met. They do these wonderful, elaborate plans. They are PowerPoint rangers like I've never seen anybody they can make things fly, and you know they, you know it's 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 wonderful. The problem that Colombia has, has always had is their plans are always much more ambitious than their resources. Okay, whether that's the peace process, whether that's the military plans that I was involved in, and and now Colombians are also experts or have been experts in the past about making lemonades out of lemons, right? So so I saw how an army commander took a plan that he didn't have the resources for. And he made it work because he was able to he was able to improvise and 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 do and make workarounds that made it work. I think Colombia's gotten themselves in a position where they can't do that anymore. And this national security plan recognizes that. They say, let's do local area control, but let's do it in a couple of select areas versus trying to do it across the whole country. Let's consolidate one area at a time. Let's let's go and use the resources we have for this area, and then we'll and then we'll prioritize it and then and move on. Okay. I see people looking at their watches and, and sweating, and so I'm, I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions. That's great. Thank you very much. Thanks.
I, I, I do want to have, um, I, 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 I am going to ask a, uh, a general question of all of you in a second, uh, which will come back to again, come back to Coca production and, you know, if the Trump administration uh, is right to be alarmed, if they're helping. So I'll ask that generally and come to our bilateral relationship. But before that, I wanted to come to this fascinating, you're saying about the FARC dissidents. So what are they doing? Are they basically creating, are they basically doing the old political wing, military wing split? The war will be continued, but through something that is now called the FARC dissidents? And or what's happening? Is it, is it an effort to get more, to be able to get money to continue the war? What is the purpose of what your assessment is? Is it's fascinating. If that's right, what are they doing? What's the what's the purpose? So, so again, I mean, it's not, I, I I I always feel alarmed at myself because it sounds like an old Cold War conspiracy theorist when I when I say this stuff. But if you study if you study um, Marxist doctrine and particularly you know that used by the FARC because the FARC are Communist Party guerrillas, and I think that's really important to say that they're Communist parties. So you have to look at Communist doctrine about how they they run themselves. There's a, there's a concept called the combination of all forms of struggle. Mm -hmm. And basically, the, that concept says that the form of struggle that predominates in any time and space depends on the relative correlation of forces that you have with, with the enemy. So if your correlation allows you to do political, uh, you know, then that's your main, that's your main effort. Right. And so what, what I see happening with FARC is they realized that they were getting, they were getting destroyed militarily. Wow. They, they really were. And so they realized that, that, that the military effort as their main line, of effort, main line of effort was not working anymore. Okay. And so the peace negotiation was to essentially stop them from essentially being destroyed mm. and to find another way, another right. means to, to the main effort to continue the revolution. No, I agree. I, I agree with David 100%. I think that, uh, that the FARC, uh, it was a tactical move to take their struggle uh, out of the... Uh, out of the jungles into uh, the, the streets of respectable uh, political uh, uh, give and take. I think that the FARC is playing the long game. I think that the FARC is what its ultimate goal is political power in Colombia. And this was a tactical move, this whole peace process play with Santos was a tactical move to launder their image and begin a so-called uh, legitimate uh, new struggle as a political party, always holding in reserve tremendous amount of cash that is probably squirreled all over the world in bank accounts that is simply going to fund as with the continuance of uh, the, uh, the dissident FARC to fund, for all intents and purposes, what appears to be a, a legitimate political movement. And, and, and I really do believe that that is the long game of the FARC. And I, if I can just start, I, I want you to go on, but if I can just start, so, but you were saying before that they got 0.34% of the vote, so, what is their what is their political end game if they can't? I mean, they're communist. We've established this, but what is their end game? And so, well, since I'm I'm sitting on the leftmost uh, group of the seats here, um, uh -huh. let me first start by saying that I I think I'm about in ninety percent of agreement with with what David and, and Jose uh -huh. are saying. Um, I, I believe that the FARC had a group of concepts of how to survive. I'm I think it might be a little bit too. Uh, giving the FARC too much credit to say that this was all some sort of master plan that they had in mind all along and they're executing it just according to the plan. I, th I think I certainly think that the FARC are surviving very well by adaptation. And you know, so number one, I, I think there is a combination of again the FARC support groups. You know, so the militias versus the regular FARC, the distribution of of who is in Venezuela, who is not in Venezuela, um, the relationship. And I think David makes a very compelling point. Uh, some of the actions of Santrich, some of the actions of, of of others showing that there were clear relationships and things that didn't make sense by, by presuming a, a total division. Um, I entirely agree that. Um, you know, there's no necessarily absolute division between FARC dissidents and non-dissidents. Um, 
but having said that, again, I, I think we probably do ourselves a disservice to say that this was a master plan. I, mean, I think the FARC, as in other groups, may have been kidding themselves to think that they had more popularity than they did, and I think it was a very unpleasant surprise for them to discover with, with their beautiful you know, new uh, moniker, also that goes by the name FARC with its big red roses and all of that, that they had such a abysmally low percentage, and, and again, that they didn't even bother to have a credible you know, presidential candidate, etc. cetera. So, so I think at this point, um, if the FARC had hopes of pursuing a political route and other routes, the political route for the moment seems clearly closed. Um, I think if the FARC had hopes of being able to continue below the table certain gray area um, narco-trafficking activities, I think the moving against Santrich and others show that that might not be as a viable option. And so I think they're being pushed increasingly more into the consolidation. I thought, I think also I was glad that uh, David mentioned Gentil Duarte, and, and I think he is one of the key figures because, as you know right now, whether it was this is all a master plot or whether this is being improvised as you go along, you know, working with, um, you know, even Mordisco, the, the first front, front uh, Duarte, and in, in, in the seventh front, some of, some of the others in, in various other parts, there is a process of trying to either re-coordinate or, or finally admitting that they're re-coordinating. Um, clearly, also, there was some coordination. Not only did, as Dave pointed out, that the ELN has doubled in size, and uh, whether that was planned or just improvised, you know, clearly the, the ELN with a complementary strategy has benefited from that, and so you now have you know, multiple different groups. And part of that benefit also comes from being reinforced by the, the Venezuelans coming across the border, and it become it, it's also reinforced by the explosion of, of, of drug production. Um, so I see the FARC as improvising at this point, but I see that process of improvisation in conjunction with the explosion of money, in conjunction with the lack of control in, in Venezuela, which, which basically feeds them, as is really, frankly, creating a situation which destabilizes and creates a, a, an almost impossible situation for, for President Duque. Well, I, mean, I don't see them as improvising, but I think implementation is messy. Right, so I mean, FARC has always planned bigger than they've been capable of doing. That's always been the case. But it doesn't mean they don't plan and that they don't try to follow the plan. But their plans don't always work out the way they planned them. That's probably the good news, right? No, I thought we agree. Well, let me ask something, um, and Jose, let me start with you, if I may, on this. <clears throat> so we have the, you know, we have the president's, we have the president's message uh, expressing frustration, if not disappointment, with President Duque. What is your sense of what? people are actually saying in the administration about Colombia? Do they understand? Do they, have a, do they have a pretty good understanding of what's going on? And so, what? yeah, so what, what is it? What are they saying? I'm not sure why, the, why, they, why the president came out and said that Duke had promised and he didn't follow his promise, because right. at least the numbers I got show that they did, you right. know, they did do what they said they were going to do. Now, did it impact how much drugs is coming to this country? Probably not, probably not that much. Because I mean, there's still a ton of a ton of right. you know, coca coming out, and not only that, but but they're you know they're increasing in quality, and and they can produce more cocaine per hectare than they were before. So, you know, there's some significant challenges out there. But in terms of in terms of what the Colombians promised they would do, uh, they have. But I mean, maybe also it's a misunderstanding of, you know, like I said, Duque, Duque has a hard time. He's 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 a minority president. I wouldn't call him a lame duck president, but he's a, he's a minority president. Who's fighting against the tide, and and he may not have been able to deliver like on spraying like he wanted to because right. because politically he's not being allowed. Jose, do you? Uh... Yes, um, uh, you know, we we're still getting to, used to a, a president that uh, doesn't operate with a filter. Um, some people like that. Uh, sometimes it it can it can cause uh, a bit of a ruckus, but it is reflective of a concern, broad-based concern within the administration. Um, I think that the meltdown in Venezuela mm -hmm. has uh, consumed a tremendous amount of time and effort of the administration and those offices and departments and agencies that are uh, entrusted with Western Hemisphere Affairs. It's when the White House uh, makes a, a, an issue like Venezuela uh, such a priority. It, it tends to sort of tax the bureaucracy. It's not that the United States government 
isn't developed enough or flexible enough to walk and chew gum at the same time. But the fact is, is when your top officials, assistant secretaries, deputies, uh, senior directors at NSC are so uh, under so much pressure to uh, focus in on Venezuela, it it sort of um, inhibits or or detracts from a concentration on a, on a, on an important ally like Colombia. My my hope right now we have uh, sort of a, a lame duck. Uh, ambassador in Bogota, I think what the administration ought to do to signal uh, our uh, commitment to President Duque is to appoint a, a political ambassador to Bogota, somebody who uh, may co have come out of government, uh, served in previous Republican administrations, that is uh, steeped in the issues already. And I think that, that a political ambassador in Bogota could, you know, with no disrespect to the, the career foreign service, Dan, uh, th I think that a political ambassador in Bogota would be a, a, a good uh, step at this time. Can I ask you, so, so how, how have people in, in Colombia, how has the government responded to uh, not just the president's statement, President Trump's statement, but have they responded generally to U.S. U.S. support or U.S. policy right now. Presumably they too are v extremely concerned, much more concerned even about Venezuela, and I'm, I assume they've been very helpful on that. But when they talk about their problems, do they feel that they're getting enough, enough response, or what's your sense? Uh, Jose, I, was, I mean, well, anyone. <laughs> I, well, from having worked with the, the Colombians, uh, we have a very, very close relationship with the Colombians. I mean, I think our, our ability to talk what they say in Spanish, tu a tu, you know, you to you, with the Colombians is better than any other country in the region. I mean, we can we can sit there and tell each other mm -hmm. our dirty laundry, and we're still friends at the at the end of the day, and and so that that still exists. Uh -huh. I mean, of course it hurts them, right? Uh, 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 you know, but I mean, I think I think one of the things about being that close is that um, you learn to forgive each other quick, and you learn that not everything that comes out is is really the way. That the government feels it may you know maybe a temporary thing, but uh, I, you know there's of course there's concern of course uh, you know of course that hurts to to you know, I mean last year they threatened to to decertify Colombia uh, you know so this isn't something that's new and you know and our relationship continues but but yeah of course it hurts mm. I, I would add uh, briefly you know the Colombian people aren't uh, exactly uh, and overly enthusiastic about the, uh, the peace agreement uh, to begin with. And if they see a, a somebody else upset about it too, meaning hmm. the U.S. government, um, it's, you know, among, uh, you know, people on the street, you know, it's probably more of a, you know, yeah, we knew. We know. That's, You're that's, telling us. That's interesting. So that, that there are people who would read it that way? Like yeah, the, read, the read President Trump saying like, yeah, we know. So exactly. Well, well, um, but the other thing that, that um, to add to what David said is uh, uh, Colombia still enjoys a, a, a strong bipartisan consensus on Capitol Hill. And what you saw um, after the president's comment was support for Colombia mm -hmm. uh, among key members of Congress, like Marco Rubio. Mm -hmm. and, and so that... Uh, that core up there, and it's bipartisan, uh, is is hugely important. And uh, because as we uh, seek to uh, get the relate get Colombia, the U.S. Colombia relationship, and maintain and and, and and help them get back on the right track, um, we need to have Congress there too. And and so that's. Uh, that's an important uh, aspect of this relationship. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open it up after you, but please go ahead. And I'm, to that, I'm going to open it up a few questions for the audience. Well, to me, um, I, I'd say Colombia is very concerned with the U.S. relationship, and I think those, that concern has metamorphosized through phases. So in 2016, 2017, when we were in the you know, passage, repassage, implementation of the peace accords, the question was, what comes next? Um, the relatively uh, generous amounts of, of money that it 
come in from the U.S. under Plan Columbia uh, were at the end of the Obama administration, of course. E- e- even then, you know, there were, there were signs of, of this being ramped down, and, and, and that question continues. Uh, obviously, there's a question also of what is the future of Colombia's relationship with the U.S. more broadly throughout the region. So, frankly, the Colombians have done a lot of help even beyond Colombia, Venezuela, with our other activities. There's something, for example, called the Columbia Action Plan. Uh, you know, the Colombians taking taking advantage of their their very professional armed forces, intelligence, other other capabilities. Obviously, uh, um, you know, Spanish fluency helping us. Um, to to train and, and improve the capabilities of, of other partners in the region. And there's a lot of that that, that, that goes on. Um, and, of course, it wasn't by coincidence that when uh, the Secretary General of NATO just, you know, just, just, just came in, um, it didn't escape mention that Colombia, of course, is the only uh, basically international associate of NATO in, 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 the, in this hemisphere. Um, frankly, Venezuela is a concern. Um, there's understanding not only the refugees and, and to what degree will the United States and others help Colombia because, I mean, Colombia is bearing the brunt of these, as as has been said before. But frankly, if the situation in Venezuela ever destabilizes, uh, you know, Colombia has good military capabilities, but there's an awful lot of, uh, you know, Russian Sukhoi 30s that were bought. You know, there was an awful lot of of, uh, BMPs and BTRs and T-72 tanks that probably wouldn't get very far, Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, would do damage into Colombia. And and frankly, I think there's a lot of desire by President Duque. Um, I mean, it was not by coincidence that that even before his inauguration, um, you know, he um, and his people were coming to Washington, D.C., and I think there's that understanding instinctively of the relationship. And so I think, um, but the concerns continue to evolve. But as, as Jose pointed out, it's almost to compare it to the relationship that the U.S. had with Great Britain during the time of Ronald Reagan and Mar- Margaret Thatcher. The, you know, aside from the Spanish, which sometimes separates us and sometimes doesn't, um, there is a, there's a sense of closeness and intimacy to the relationship that I think isn't there with just about any other relationship. Um, there is a gentleman in the back. If you would identi- wait for the microphone and identify yourself. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Rick Fisher, a uh, dedicated uh, follower of Evan's uh, scholarship on Latin America and China. Uh, and I, I have a question specifically about the FARC. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, noting that China maintains a, a very sophisticated, the Chinese Communist Party maintains a very sophisticated international liaison department that uh, li- uh, has relationships for the party with ruling and non-ruling parties, ruling and non-ruling communist parties. And uh, my question, also noting uh, my, my past ability to uh, review captured uh, communist party documents from, o- from other countries, there's a definite uh, tendency on the part of communist parties to want to talk about their relationships with, uh, with friends, people who support them. They want to make their rank and file know that they're not alone. They're part of the vanguard and all that. So in, in looking at uh, the, the captured uh, documents of, of the FARC and uh, reflecting, David, on the degree to which you, you followed them as a communist revolutionary movement, I'm wondering if there's any internal uh, source of, of perspective, views, or even uh, solid relationships between the, the FARC and uh, any element of China. Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, I have not found any evidence to date of that relationship. Um, and I, I get to see this stuff all the time, so so I haven't seen it. Um, you know, there's just, just a bit of history. The FARC, the FARC falls on the Soviet side of the, of the Sino-Soviet split. And, and so they're very, they stayed very much in that line. Um, so they do study Mao. For example, I mean, a lot of there's uh, there's two documents by by written by Mao that are like on all the captured FARC computers, but that's the extent of it. And a lot of their Maoism uh, came from the Vietnamese. And there's actually there's actually documentation and some evidence of the Vietnamese sending people in the in the late 80s, early 90s into Colombia, running around providing training. They actually have a Vietnamese manual that that, that I think was produced during that time. And so that's where they get their, their, their Chinese doctrine comes through the Vietnamese versus through the, through the Chinese themselves. Now, that may change because, because China has been increasingly aggressive. Uh, China has the relationship with, with many allies of the FARC, such as the FMLN in El Salvador, such as the PSUV in, in Venezuela, and some of the other parties that FARC does have a relationship with. So 
the only evidence that I have is of an indirect relationship with China through their allies who are also allies with, with the Chinese. That's very interesting. Yeah. And Rick, thanks for the plug. It's, it's always great to see you. For those of you who don't know, uh, Rick Fisher is, is probably one of the first and foremost uh, experts on, on weapon sales and in weapons-related issues a, across Latin America. And he's actually the go-to guy for me whenever I have weapons questions. So uh, Rick, great to see you again. Um, the only thing I could add to what David's saying, and I think the one point David hinted at, but I think it's worth really repeating, is that um, when we think of FARC communist doctrine, we underestimate the degree to which it, it was inspired by Maoist doctrine, I'll be coming from the, the Vietnamese, um, more than necessarily Soviet doctrine. And that had some important determinations, differences in understanding what the FARC was actually trying to achieve through really kind of a people's warfare approach. Uh, there are, frankly, some hints of, of especially when you go on the ELN side, um, and especially some f former ELN people that may have some relationships, I believe, with Oficina de Envigado in, in Medellin. Um, but the trail kind of fades away, at least in the public level, uh, at, at, at that point. Um, so there are some suggestions, but it, it's hard to get farther than that. Uh, are there other, uh, this, again, if you can identify yourself and wait for the microphone. Hi, my name is Julia Friedman. I'm um, interning right now at the Columbia program on the Washington Office on Latin America. Um, and I was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about um, the interest in eradicating coca as a means to peace in Colombia and Venezuela, which I think is definitely a lot of a goal. But I'm wondering about the strategy of crop fumigation. Um, I mean, setting aside the human rights concerns of how the World Health Organization has identified the fumigation chemicals as part potentially carcinogenic to humans, um, I was wondering if, doesn't it seem like more of a game of whack-a-mole to keep on uh, trying to eradicate coca in Colombia when there's definitely a compelling profit motive because the, a gram of cocaine in America on the U.S. streets sells for $165. So don't you think it would be like a, a little bit more of um, a targeted use and a better use of U.S. resources uh, to partner with the Colombians, not only in er eradicating drug markets and drug smuggling in Colombia, but also uh, trying to reduce the demand here. Does anyone want to answer so, that? You've, I, I'm you've, happy to answer that. You've asked, yeah, that, that, you've, yeah. asked, you've asked one of the questions that continually gets asked. So there's a couple of things. Um, me personally, I've never been interested in eradicating coca as a matter of, you know, again, if there's demand, there's going to be supply. Someone's going to supply it. But it's really a matter of security. And there's a direct correlation between, between how much coca is being grown and how much security there is in the countryside. Uh, there, there just is. And, and so a lot of the gains made by the Uribe government were made because they were highly successful in eradicating, co in eradicating coca. Uh, it got down to 43,000 hectares. Now it's 2009, and security and the security issues are now again in the news because coke is there, and how do, how do you enforce contracts in a in a legal market through violence? I want to I, I want to just ask you to for a clarification. Are you saying that instead of focusing so much on Colombia, we should also be worried about how these things about our appetite for these different drugs? I think. So. I just want to. I just want to. Yeah, I think when we're looking at uh, trying to enact a pol help people enact mm -hmm. a policy abroad, we should also be focusing not only on our domestic concerns, because uh, as to make ourselves more of a partner for Colombia, um, but also because the rural security situation that we're all very concerned about. Uh, it tends to be exacerbated by attempts to eradicate coca by force. Um, so, like, what we're looking at a huge increase in human rights defenders being assassinated in rural areas. Uh, they are currently the population that's most under threat in Colombia, um, and the coca eradication and coca substitution activists are among the people who are uh, the most targeted in this population. So I think um, in order to uh, show Colombia that we, uh, on a good faith on the U.S. part, is that we would be, uh, and, and it's a better use of our resources here, is to start looking at how we can reduce the demand for cocaine use in the United States. So, so the second half to the question I didn't, that I didn't finish at, as answering was that coca, sub, coca, coca substitution is far more expensive than coca spray. So uh, right now, the substitution program, if it was being done as it's supposed to be done, would cost around 5 to $7 billion. 
and coca and coca spraying was sixty five million right. dollars. I, I I understand and, that. And then the other thing, and then the final thing, is there's no sticks. There's all carrots and no sticks with the current substitution program, and so there's no incentive not to grow coca. I think that when you're looking at um, people who are growing the coca, I don't know whether, like many of them have expressed that they would rather grow other crops because they're beholden to uh, just uh, the, the kind of narco traffickers that you're talking about that are not, uh, they, they don't really want to be beholden to these people in the first place. Well, and I agree that it's more expensive to, to do uh, coca. Hectares. I agree that it's more expensive to do coca substitution programs, but the problem with fumigation is that that's not a long-term solution because uh, if you fumigate, they're just going to replant it, and they have found more strains that are uh, more immune to the. Evan, do you want to? Sure. Let me, and first, let me let me say a, a, a kind of a range of things. So, first of all, um, I, I think you make a very important point that, um, among other things, and this applies to our, our Mexican partners, this applies to our Honduran partners, this applies to, to many people that um, you know, there's much more that the U.S. needs to do to get uh, the demand for, 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 for drugs under, under control. Uh, yes, it is part of the problem, although it's certainly not only coca. We have problems, horrible problems with fentanyl and opioids and things that have relatively little to do with, with, with Colombia. But I, I think it is important to recognize that this is a problem that we need to continue to combat. And also, I recognize that uh, although I'm about to respectfully disagree with you on a couple of points, um, I do very much... In a free and open society, very different than the one we have in places like Venezuela, it's important that there's a range of, of views and, and the, the questioning of the prevailing wisdom always goes on. And so I, I applaud the work of, of Wall in that in, in that regard. And I think, again, that's what separates us from, say, Nicolas Maduro. Um, having said that, um, with respect to fumigation, I, I think, to me, it comes down to what is the, what is the, the least bad of, of evils that most advances prosperity in, in human life and, and things like that. And I think there's some hard choices because, as, as David rightly pointed out, um, on the one hand, fumigation does tend to be far cheaper and more effective. And, and ironically, it is actually, even though it's prohibited, prohibited now for anti-narcotics, it actually, those same chemicals are actually still used in Colombia for other types of, of, of treatment. So it's, it's a bit of a political... Yeah, it's it, vegetables. Yeah, so it's it's a bit of a political misnomer that this is like such a horrible thing that you know it you know not safe at any cost. Um, number two, with respect to substitution, yeah, there's, and even back to the U.S. substitution programs for the last twenty years, um, you know whether it's us doing it or whether it was the Colombians doing it, there have always been inherent problems with substitution. It's it's a good idea, you know, give the noble peasants a, a way of not having to you know do you know, sell bad things in the service of the evil narcos. Um, and, and that's a fair point. However, one of the problems is until you build the infrastructure, and as we talked mm -hmm. about, um, you know, you can't get those other products to market. Um, number two, if you don't have the money, and again, uh, as David pointed out, um, there's about $7 billion worth of commitments were made to 100,000 um, know, different farmers. Um, I think the most recent estimates that I saw were only about 40,000 of those people actually got paid. Um, and 90% of the people at least got paid incompletely. And so, frankly, the substitution, there wasn't money for it, and the way it was implemented was a disaster. And, frankly, it ended up actually reinforcing some of the narco mafias because the people who were actually getting payments were actually the people who were on the cooperative side of the narco program. So they were actually getting paid to support the drug dealers in an ironic sort of way. Now, as you point out, I, I think in frustration, President Duque has turned to ramping up, as David also pointed out, forced eradication, which in some way is good and bad. I mean, it's it's good in the sense that, you know, you 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 get away from some of the defects of substitution, but obviously when people have forced eradication, they're gonna start planting again, and then you have to go back and, and, and do it again. And and frankly also more people die in forced eradication, but they're usually on the side of the police, than die from glyphosate spraying. And so at the end of the day, what, what it brings me back down to is, is what is the way to protect the most number of lives and best advance the interests of, of the Colombian people in an environment with no money? And you're absolutely right. There are, there are no easy answers here, and it's a very hard problem that you know, we've been working for many years. And so I think it's right to ask hard questions. So we're just gonna, we're gonna wrap up in a second. There's someone on this side, but a question, so I just wanna give this person <clears throat> the, the last question. Was there someone here? Did someone, did you have a, was it already answered? No. Uh, well, I guess I, what, what I'll just start by saying is it sounds like a dinner conversation at my house. Uh, <laughs> okay. Because, uh, you know, we have both sides of the opinions 
And uh, the the main point that I'd like to make really is that um, you know we look at these things from a very sort of granular perspective when we discuss just the security Columbia, U.S. Security Columbia Alliance. But when you look, when you step back, I was at something else. Um, and by the way, I, I'm I'm Johns Hopkins. I'm sorry to be a, 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 a pain, but we are kind of coming to an end. So if you have a question, that would be terrific. The, the question is, okay. um, when you look at the alliance mm -hmm. uh, and the security impacts, we're looking also at, at what happens at the, at the bigger picture level of a country. When the GDP of a country gets to eight to $12,000 per, per, per capita, then you have m much fewer problems with this, with this particular problem of, of one side saying, you know, we want to take over the government and, be, and become a Marxist model. And so I'm wondering, the question is, Thanks. where are we with, with regard to that in terms of like looking at it from that perspective? Are we advancing at all in terms of like how are we going to educate the people that really need to rise up in the economy? That's my question. I, I think that President, President Uribe said it best that, you know, they used to look at it as, well, we need to solve the social problem first and then violence will take care of itself. But what they found is that, that when they did that, they just kept feeding the violence, that they really needed the security, that the security actually helped then bring in investors and then bring in business, and that it created this virtuous cycle of, of security. And so, and, you know, so, you know it's, it's, it's a question of which comes first. And, and I think in Colombia, at least, that um, moving towards the security side, and, and, and especially democratic security, where they were trying to provide security for everybody, not just, not just Bogota or not just, you know, not just the big cities, that that had a huge impact on their economy. And their economy grew tremendously between, was it 2003 and 2000, 2010. Um, and and I think they've lost a bit of that, and I think uh, they need to recover it. Just very quickly, I, I think that the historical uh, Achilles heel of Colombia has been the inability to uh, have sustainable government control over the entire territory of the country. It's a very difficult country to po top topographically. Uh, uh, from jungles to, to split by uh, Andean peaks. Um, it has been very difficult to establish that kind of security through the entire swath of the country. And because of circumstances, demand for uh, recreational drugs in the United States, it has uh, exacerbated uh, Colombia's destiny. And, um, and I think that until Colombia is in a place where government authority uh, is established throughout the uh, the entire, you know, every single kilometer of, of territory, square kilometer of territory. Um, Colombia is going to continue to have challenges. Two quick points. Um, number one, never underestimate the education and sophistication of, of the Colombian people. Um, these are intractable problems, and the fact that the Colombians are still suffering from them is not for lack of education or lack of, of, of sophistication. Number two, with respect to, to your point, to me the key is coordination. Um, there's lots of talk about interagency, whole of government, blah, blah, blah. To me, and I mean, you've got Plan Salvador Seguro by the former Salvadorian president. To me, what separates the success from the failure isn't whether you sprinkle social programs or what mix, but it's how well you make it all work together. And I think through things like, um, you know, um, some of the successes the Colombians had was very activist, capable presidents, especially President Uribe, um, working the problems of, of making sure that you get that coordination right between you know, clearing out the threats, bringing in the authorities, um, actually creating a situation where people are inspired to invest, making investment possible with compatible tax regimes, things like that. You know, the key is getting it all working together in unison. And, and I think that takes intelligence and persistence and, and leadership, frankly. That's great. Evan, thank you very much. Jose, David, and thank you to Hudson Institute and uh, Ambassador Darren Bloom. Thank you for a wonderful afternoon.